your work's had a huge impact on on my life. Um, my wife first got me uh, this book, the Learn to Love Yourself workbook, um, and it was yeah really transformative. Uh, just everything you lay out is so kind of clear and powerful and simple in it, but in a way that's kind of really revolutionary. So I thought maybe we could begin there. Um, but also, I mean, I'm interested in the fact that you must you must hear things like this from thousands of people, like whose lives you've you've helped. And I guess I'm intrigued as to what that's like to have such an impact on people. Well, just as you say that, it brings tears to my eyes because it's the most wonderful thing in the world. I, uh, you know, I always say I live on a steady diet of miracles because every day when I open my inbox or look on Instagram or something, I get to hear that and I never get tired of it to me it fulfills the purpose of my life because I, I created the purpose of my life in my thirties, which was to expand every day in love, creativity, abundance, and, um, and to inspire other people to do the same thing. And so if I'm able to do that, I'm having a great day. Plus I want to make sure I'm doing it myself. And uh, so far so good. Katie and I are about to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary in October. So um I've been able to apply just about everything I've learned. Uh, and you have to do that if you're going to stay married successfully for 40 years. Yeah, well, congratulations. And um, we'll get on to, uh, to that towards the end, I'm sure. Um, and so maybe we could begin with a bit about the, the kind of core ideas in learning to love yourself, because this idea of, of self-love is something that's really not widespread in our culture, I would say, which is why, to me, you, were, you know, this, this book was like a kind of shining light that just kind of showed me the way. Um, in my kind of own personal journey. Uh, maybe we could begin with your story of how you first discovered uh, this kind of revolutionary thing of self-love. One of the great days of my life, actually. Um, I had just, uh, now we'll time travel back to the year of 1974. You may not have even been born then or just yeah. barely probably. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the locale was Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. I had just the year before finished up my PhD at Stanford and I'd gotten a new job as an assistant professor at the University of Colorado's branch, graduate school branch in Colorado Springs. And a week before the whole thing was to start when I was supposed to take my new job on, I was wandering around out in the woods near this cabin I'd rented in Colorado. And as I was wandering around, I realized I was feeling a lot of anxiety. And when I checked it out, what my anxiety was about in my body, I realized I felt like I didn't know anything. And, you know, at Stanford, the PhD program and my master's program before, I had learned everything <laughs> about counseling psychology. But in a way, I didn't know anything because I feel, felt like I didn't understand and know the central reason people get themselves stuck and the one way we can always get ourselves out of it. So that was what I was feeling the lack of in my training. In other words, I'd never really had a complete whole body experience of transforming something in myself or helping somebody else transform something instantaneously. I came from the background where you, you're you supposed to stay in therapy or keep the person in therapy for years at a time. You know, it's not about, but I thought something could, there must be something in human behavior that we can do that gets ourselves unstuck quickly. So that was my, my wondering. So I realized also that I had asked professors for these kinds of questions and asked therapists, but I'd never really just ask myself or ask the universe around me. And I was just beginning to understand metaphysically that we are the universe, that it's not us versus them, that we're made of the same stuff as everything else in the universe. And so that was kind of in the back of my mind, too. So I asked the universe directly. I was standing out by a tree, and 
I asked the universe, I said, what is the one thing that we keep doing wrong that gets ourselves stuck as human beings? And what is the one thing that we could do that would always reliably unstick us so that we could get back into the flow of intimacy or good feeling or whatever we desired? And so that was the question. And I asked it, and I just kind of, I think for once in my life, just kind of sat back and waited for an answer and and made myself open. There's an old saying that um, prayer is talking to God, meditation is listening. And so there I was in a moment of listening, um, maybe like I'd never done before, and I was rewarded for it because I got this tremendous download of information in that moment. And what I got was that the one thing we do wrong is to keep ourselves at a distance from whatever we're experiencing. Like, you know, if if you're feeling miserable and you walk into a grocery store and the clerk says, how are you today, Mr. Cook? And you say, I'm fine, right? I mean, you don't say, hey, you know, I've had the crappiest morning. Uh, Rebecca did this and then the kids did that and then the dog did that. And, you know, about that time, the the, uh, clerk is going to say, Stop, stop, too much information. So we keep a lot of things hidden inside ourselves. And the problem is, it's not just the the clerk at the grocery store. I would say we've had 4,500 couples work with us here. And I would say the number one complaint that we hear, uh, particularly from women in the relationship, if it's a male-female relationship, is very frequently the woman will say, I just got tired of him never telling me how he really felt, you know, and I just can't stand that anymore. So one of the training things that we do is is teach simple ways of identifying your emotions so that people don't have that complaint about you. But boy, in the beginning, I had that problem big time. I was very intellectual guy. I was, you know, you got to be pretty head smart to wend your way through a PhD at Stanford and deal with all the kind of stuff that goes along with that. Um, I always say that getting my doctorate was like, uh, you know, those Bobo the Clown things that kids have that you punch them and they go down and then they pop back up. And uh, getting the PhD in counseling psychology was, I think the, the main professor's job was to knock down the Bobo the Clown doll over and over again and see if you could get back up for you know, uh, 118 times and see if you could get back up to 119th. And uh, so, and there's a good value in that because you have to deal with a lot of extreme situations and they want to make sure you're prepared for that. But it was mostly intellectual kind of work. And I had never really cultivated a relationship with my own emotions inside. So in that moment, I got this download that the one thing we do is be unloving toward ourselves. We criticize ourselves, we shame ourselves, we go out of our way to talk about our problems. But how many people do you see sitting down at the pub talking about their successes? You know, it's just something that we don't do very much in life. So what I did in that moment was I decided to reverse it. I decided, okay, I've been unloving toward myself a thousand times, 10,000 times. I'm just going to pause right now and love myself for everything I am and everything I'm not. (sighs) And so for a little while there, I don't know how long it took, a couple of minutes, I just kind of wandered around out in the forest there, loving all the things that I'd never loved about myself. I was overweight at the time, and so I loved my extra poundage, and I was, uh, I realized I was carrying around a lot of anger about some things that had happened in my life with the breakup of a relationship and some grief about that, and I'd never really actually love myself. I'd try to keep myself away from that kind of thing. Um, one of your almost countryman, James Joyce, there's a great line in one of his books um, where he says, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And in a way, that's the problem I'm talking about, that we kind of, by filtering everything through our minds, 
we kind of lift ourselves out of having to deal with things we're angry about, scared about, sad about. But those things won't stay hidden forever. Eventually, they're going to pour out in the middle of an argument or after a few beers or they're, they're going to be outed in some way. And what I decided to do was love those things and, and get to the bottom of them by loving them rather than trying to shame them away or push them away. And so that's what I started doing in that moment. And the amazing things, um, I'm being a little long-winded here, but it's a, an important story. Stop me if I'm uh, no, no, going it's, it's too, great. Uh, <laughs> too far. But I got rewarded for it the next day by an unusual thing that happened. I, I had just moved to Colorado from California, so I didn't have a private practice or anything like that set up. I'd literally only been there a few weeks. And I'd met at the faculty get acquainted party, the wife of one of my fellow faculty members, another psychologist in the department. And she called me the next day after I'd had this big experience and said that she was having some issues come up and she'd really enjoyed talking to me at the party. And could she come over and process them? And, you know, she said, I'd be happy to pay you. And, all. and I said, no, no, come on over, you know, we'll talk about it. And, see what you need. And um, I didn't want to, you know, do a therapy session with her because it was kind of a dual relationship sort of thing since I knew her socially. But anyway, I told her I, I listened to whatever was going on with her. So she came over and she told me this amazing story about this anxiety, this kind of like crazy anxiety attack she was having because she thought her husband was having an affair for a long time but she kept saying to him, you know, is something wrong? Are you having a, you know, and he kept stonewalling her saying, no, you're crazy. Yo, oh, you're crazy. But then it came out that he actually was. And so she went into this massive little spiral of betrayal. And also nobody likes being lied to, you know, uh, and um, especially if the other person is making you feel crazy that you're suspecting something. And so it's an old story, but it happens over and over and over again in relationships, unfortunately. And so having had this experience the, uh, the day before, instead of trying to talk her out of her anxiety or do a relaxation exercise or something like that that I'd learned in school, I invited her to simply love and experience her anxiety. Instead of trying to make it go away, I, I should have mentioned, too, when she first came in, um, I don't know if people will be seeing the video of this, but she was almost like she was sitting on a hornet's nest. She was so anxious, she almost vibrating. And it was because I found out that she was trying to hold this anxiety at bay. And so I came along, having had the experience the day before, and I said, go ahead, let's just experience that together. Let's love it as it is. I don't find it unlovable in any way. And I don't want you to make it go away. I want you to just be with it because you've earned your anxiety. So let's not shame it or make it go away. And so she did that. And over the next 15 minutes, she just let herself feel it. And she was kind of vibrating and breathing deeply and everything. But the amazing thing that happened was after about 15 minutes, the energy subsided and she had this big smile on her face. Wow, she said, what happened? Was that some special technique you learned at Stanford? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted to say, yes, yes, dear, that was, you know, that. Uh, but uh, no, I said, that was you. You know, you were just feeling and being with rather than trying to make it go away. And you were loving what was there rather than trying to shame it away. That was a big moment for me because then I got to see the practical value of this experience that I just had the day before. So that's my um, uh, long-winded uh, story about the moment of first learning to love myself. I don't think I've ever had a moment in my life I, you know, that had the most lifetime impact. Because now when I work with a client, I've, I think my students counted up that I'd seen something like 20,000 individual clients and about 1,000 executives over the years. And I can't think of a single session that I've done 
that I haven't used the background wisdom of that moment uh, to steer me through it. Yeah, I mean, I think I've gotten a similar thing unfolded, you know, through me reading your words in, in your book um, and then practicing it myself. And yeah, in, I've, I've rarely experienced anything that powerful and I, I couldn't believe how how powerful this this method was. And also I was 29 when it happened. I think you were 29 as well when this happened. Yes, as a matter of yeah. fact, I was. Wow. I've seen I've seen that in a few people that 20, I don't know if it's something about 30 approaching and it feels like a make or break moment in life, but I've seen a lot well, of people you know, transformation there. In developmental psychology, we say your job in your 20s is to experiment, make a lot of mistakes, try out a lot of new things. In your 30s, you find your life. In your 40s, you build your life. In your 50s, you enjoy your life. Those are the priorities. And people in their 30s, you know, they're often busy finding their life and, you know, doing more of what's already working and trying to find out something that's their genius. And in your 40s, you're, you know, kind of established and beginning to really build the components. And so oftentimes until our 50s, we don't get around to saying, ah, you know, maybe I can relax a little bit. Of course, I know people in their 70s and 80s who haven't had that moment, you know, <laughs> of, ah, I have a couple of uh, billionaires that visit me once or twice a year, and uh, they're up in their 70s now, but they haven't lost a moment of that competitive edge yet. You know, they're still, uh, now instead of playing Monopoly, they're playing Monopoly with real buildings and companies and things like that, but they still get the same amount of zest from it. <laughs> I think um, with the stories you gave, it was really excellent illustration of, of the core ideas of this this practice of self love. Because I think when people first hear about the idea of, of self love, they might think it's something where you know the mind is finding reasons to love yourself, and you're you're just saying to yourself, uh, you have this belief, you know, that I am worthy of love. But the way you write about it is that this this almost meditative kind of very experiential beyond mind. And truly unconditional, right? You mentioned about it, you described it, you know, almost being the same thing as acceptance, really feeling your feelings. And to me, that seems to fit with this unconditional um, approach you're taking to feeling whatever arises in consciousness. Yes, because one of my definitions of love has to do with space. A very important part of love is space. Love comes with physical sensations, you know, you could feel a warmth in your chest or, a, you know, a kind of a whole body feeling of attraction or something, but it's really about giving, the, giving yourself space to be all of who you are and giving the other person space to be all of who they are. That's to me a wonderful form of love because if you're not giving the other person space to be who they are, you're trying to control them or shape them or sculpt them in some way. And that's dreadfully unfair to the other person, but it's really unfair to yourself because you don't have the possibility then of their creative unfoldment because you're caught inside your control programming. That's one of the things the new book is about, James, is about how to gently and benignly let go of that control so that the actual juicy stuff of this moment can appear. And to me, like, you know, I ask people all the time, and I'll just ask you, think of, think of someone you know for sure you love. Rebecca or whoever you think of. Just think of that person that you know absolutely in your mind nobody could talk you out of loving them. You just love them. Okay, I think of my wife, Kathleen, also known as Katie. Uh, I think of my daughter, Amanda, I, other people, friends in my life. And nobody in the world could talk me out of loving them. I love them. I just do. Now, here's the thing. Feel that same feeling toward yourself. It's as simple as that because you already are wired knowing how to love another person. Let's just make sure we give ourselves the same benign bath in love that we're giving other people. <laughs>